like so i have i have mad tinnitus well i'm surprised because the punk stuff is very loud and you're supposed to uh, what's it called the thing they put in the ear like earplugs oh earplugs yeah <laughs> <laughs> what's it called earplugs shadi you still need to learn how to use that microphone Wait, okay so what the you... top you see like just like speak into the top of it yeah. okay but like, so i can't move around and stuff I mean, you can but just like okay, so, come back to it so, when you do so like this yeah that's good you can hear yourself Okay, yeah, I can hear myself a bit more. Yeah, yeah. that's all. Like, okay. just do that. I mean, you can speak off. You'll just sound like you're in a room far <laughs> away from everyone. Oh, man. So, I don't know, Jamie. Do you listen to podcasts? I've started listening to them more. Mm. Um, I really I think since the um, New York Times debacle with the, uh, mm. the Cotton op-ed, I think I've found sort of alternative media being more um, important. Mm. And just wanting to hear other critiques and voices. I've just, I guess I should say my, my faith in the mainstream media, what was left of it, um, really took a turn for the worse precisely when the, when the Bennett thing happened, when the James Bennett firing happened. And then it seemed like all of these voices were sort of emerging. I mean, your podcast is on for a couple months, but you were there and my friends at the Fifth Column. And then I, I kind of got into the Brett Weinstein podcast mm. a little bit and Joe Rogan. I just felt like that's where all the sort of um, interesting voices are now, right? I, they're not, they're not in, in traditional... Oh, we have a Joe Roganite here then. Yeah. Well, well you know, I'm not, I don't listen to him that often. I, I just started listening to him. I'm not like a, like, like a long-term fan, but I'm... No, I, I've just I'm, started myself on Joe Rogan try, just trying to sort of... So I, I, he's I, a very good interviewer. That's it. He's great. He just like, he just sort of, he sits down and just sort of starts rapping with people. He's it's a very great. good interviewer. But it's, it's funny because I, I, you know, we've been doing this now. Are we up on a year yet, Sean? Yeah, we're coming close, up. I think August is August. You've been doing it for that long. Yeah, wow. yeah. People didn't care in the beginning. <laughs> now they care. Not well. I don't know. Something. something <laughs> I think it's like when you that. started the Substack is when it really. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, or when David when when David Brooks tweeted you. I think that's when. You oh really, yeah, that, that was that, nice. That's when that you was made nice it. of him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, no, but I mean, uh, we I, also I, had a former president on the podcast. Not a lot of people know about. Oh, that's that. right. Yes, that's right. Without, of that Georgia. Was, <laughs> <laughs> And we also the country, have, not the state. You know, you know, Misha. You, you, I've you, had dinner with him once. Yeah, yeah, I feel like everyone's had dinner with the former <laughs> Georgian president. We haven't. We haven't. If you, said live in, if you live in Brooklyn, yeah, okay. yeah. No, no. But for me, like podcasts, is, it's weird because I've just only started listening as well. Um, but in a weird way, because I don't know, Shadi and I've been like, well, all right, this is sort of working. So I just got to figure out where what else works for people because it's like, yeah, you know, there's so much weird stuff. Because well, there's nothing. I mean. There used to be Charlie Rose, right? And that yeah. was maybe the closest thing to in intelligent intellectual talk. Yeah. That's gone. Yeah. You cannot watch cable news at all. It right. is total junk food yep. for your brain. Yeah. All three cable news networks. Yep. There must be exceptions, though. On cable news? Yeah, like Dr. No. Carlson. <laughs> But that's not a conversation. That's I'm, that's I'm, a I'm, a yeah. monologue. <laughs> to be clear to our dear listeners, yeah. that was that was shot and being ironic. That was jest. And I feel I just feel that like there's a real absence. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, and I think, I think there's there's a void, and it's being filled largely but, you know, by podcasts. Did you ever, Shadi? You're 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 a man of the left. Did you ever listen to like the the dirtbag left, the 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 those the Chapo, Chapo people? Trap house. Yeah, because that that seems like it was a golden era of podcasting that passed me by completely. Yeah, see, but they're still going on, right? Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I only listened to one El Chapo episode. It was the one with our um, our mutual friend Elizabeth Brunig, mm. and I was just curious to see how she would engage in on in that kind of format, and then. I guess there's Red Scare. Yeah, and, Red Scare. Which I, because of you, I started listening to, and it's kind of, it's really intriguing, but at first you don't really get it, but then you're like, hmm. Yeah. Did you listen to the most recent one? No. no. <laughs> I've just listened to two episodes, and I'm, I'm kind of hooked. You know, I don't, have you heard this one? No, the Chapel guys have really gone after me a couple of times. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I'm oh, actually, yeah, actually, I heard that. And they, they make fun of they you. They do. There's actually a cartoon of me in their book. Hmm. Oh. Why, why did Drawn by Eli so Valley. Why do they hate me so much? You'd have to ask them. I don't know. I don't listen to them, but they don't like me. Yeah, so I just for they don't our... like they don't like my friends either. They don't. They seem not to like Jewish writers who are sort of right of center, <laughs> mm. who are pro Israel. It's kind of a thing with them. kind of a thing, kind of a thing, a thing on the left. Yeah. yeah well, so... just I can't speak for the whole left, but just right. these these guys. These guys. <laughs> so we should tell our listeners uh, that this might be interesting to them that um, before many years ago, I knew Jamie as this carmudgeonly presence at the New Republic wor working with <laughs> Marty Peretz. And I had read some of his stuff and I had this image of Jamie as this scary pro-Israel right-winger. All and, true. And then 
And then I think in like 2014, I moved back to DC and I went to this picnic that was hosted by a Washington Post writer, Lisa Bonos. And then Jamie, I think, was great, there. Who, was like, who writes a great column, by the way. Yeah, on yeah. dating. Yes, yeah. on dating, yeah. And then Jamie was there. I'm like, oh my God, is that Jamie Kirchick? The Jamie Kirchick. In the flesh. Yeah. And, I ha- and I thought he was a monster. <laughs> But you, you checked my head for th- for horns, <laughs> didn't you? That's what you learned in Madrasa. That's not. That, that's not. <laughs> oh, wow, this is good. Yeah. Um, but but then I realized he was a normal person. We didn't become friends. It took some time to become friends. I think that happened a little bit later in like 2017. And now people are going to be maybe offended to hear this, but Jamie and I are friends. Yeah. yeah. Wh- which people are going to be offended to hear this? <laughs> I don't your people, your 150,000 followers? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, but to be fair, Jamie's also now my colleague too. True. At yeah, Brookings. That's right. And maybe this is a good way to introduce, well, yeah. you know, introduce yeah. Jamie. Jamie Kirchick of, of Brookings, <laughs> uh, author of The End of Europe, uh, working on a forthcoming book about uh, gay DC. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to say a few words about the book, or, um, or is it secret? Actually, it's probably a secret. Yeah, that's what that's might be the title. I don't know. Uh, I'd rather it's it's uh, yeah. It, it'll be out next year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Sounds that's good. Cool. Sounds Great. good. Um, and yeah. he also has a new article out, which maybe is a good way to to start in Tablet Magazine, which I should also say has become an incredible outlet. I think yeah. this is this is this is the peak of Tablet, yeah. and well, maybe not the peak, but. Maybe they're going higher. Yeah, it'll go higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean seriously. I, it's it's just, but it's it's. I think it's the best magazine going at yeah, this point. Yeah, yeah. Easily agree. And yeah. Jamie has a, a new piece. I think it came out yesterday today called John John Lewis and the Jews. Somewhat provocative. Well, that was what I. That was what I. Oh, that was the oh, email I sent. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I think it's called the Man Who Opposed Hate. Was the title. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's probably more political correct. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what it's about. It's about John yeah. Lewis and the Jews. Yeah, that's a great title. It's too bad they didn't go with that. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> um. But yeah. maybe, maybe just set the scene for us, because I think the article is about John Lewis, but it's actually about something broader. Yeah. It, it uses the example of John Lewis to get to some some bigger issues in the national conversation yeah. around anti-Semitism, wokeness, yeah. and the, the inability of many on the left to condemn not just problematic voices, but racist voices, yeah. including right. Louis Farrakhan. Yeah. Well, you know, I have to admit I was not knowledgeable of this when I read it in John Lewis's obituary, but it mentioned that he refused to go to the Million Man March in 1995, which was led by Louis Farrakhan. And I remember, actually, I think I was 12 years old. I was probably preparing for my bar mitzvah. And it was a huge news. I mean, this was, you know, O.J. Simpson had just been acquitted of murder two weeks before, so racial politics in America were certainly at their worst in decades. Uh, and then I remember reading that Rosa Parks was going to be speaking at mm. this event. And, you know, like every American kid learns who Rosa Parks is. And that was very disturbing. Why is Rosa Parks speaking at this hateful man who hates Jews event? Mm. Why, is he, why is he doing that? And, and you knew back then that Louis Farrakhan... He was really in the news a lot. Yeah. I, I just, at least, I remember him being on like 2020, I think that show. And, and your Walters. perception of him was that he, here's an anti-Semite. Yes. And, hate, well, because yeah. he was, I, I remember him being asked on television... You know, you say Jews are what blood suckers or yeah, something. Right. I mean, he was just sort of nodding along, and yeah, I mean, he was a pretty yeah. flagrant example, and has never apologized for it. Um, does he? Does he temper that stuff these days? No, no he's still no, he's still no, doing no. the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I saw something recent where I think Tamika Mallory was in the yes. front row. Maybe that was from two last, years ago. Two but years this was ago. The whole the whole women's march. That's right. Imploded, yeah. imploded yeah. Yeah. because Overdose. of Louis Farrakhan. Yeah. But, and I and I watched so I watched some of this, and I have to say, first of all, he. He's quite a distinctive speaker. I mean, I mean, there was a whole like Saturday Night Live sketches about that, if I remember correctly, back in the yeah, day. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not used to hearing people talk like that, so that makes it a bit scarier because you can see how yeah. he plays on the passions of the audience, and he's able to get the audience worked up in right. part because he is a very good orator, or orator, orator, yeah, orator. <laughs> Um, but I remember even two years ago, he was still saying like, pretty, pretty explicitly anti-Semitic yeah. stuff. He hasn't stopped. And, um, and of course, over the past couple of weeks, there's been all these celebrities and uh, professional athletes who've been tweeting some of these hateful comments. And that kind of leads back to John Lewis, which I didn't know that he had opposed the march and didn't go. And I did some research and he wrote this piece in Newsweek and he was very clear about it. And he said, I can't 
uh, you know, stand up for uh, civil rights and I can't, you know, honor the, the legacy of Martin Luther King if I participate in an event like this. And it also, I think it's interesting in terms of the, the woke argument today, is at the end of the article he wrote, he said, Martin Luther King would have never supported an all black march. Hmm. He supported integration uh, as being uh, really the, the end goal of America. The, the ambition, and I think that is really um, sort of at cross purposes with a lot of kind of the, the woke ideology today, which seems to be wanting to essentialize us by race and divide us by race again. Yeah. Um, and maybe I'm, you know, putting too much into this, but that's when well, I so read when I, when I read what he wrote twenty years, twenty five years ago. That's that's the, the lesson that I take from it. So when I was reading your piece, it, it struck me because I actually wasn't aware of all these recent anti Semitic incidents. I was aware of someone named, I think, Deshaun. Yeah, he was Deshaun. the first. Yeah, that's the only one. And then it was like ten days straight of all. The, look, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not. I don't follow professional sports, so I don't know any of these people. But Ice Cube, mm. who's very, who's very well known, he was, and he's unapologetic about it. Uh, but, but that's the amazing thing that it didn't get that much attention. Right. You think like flagrant anti-Semitism would be a bigger controversy, and now and to kind of see how many people have said yeah. these kinds of things in the last month, right? But it really hasn't, I think, you know, filtered as much into the mainstream of conversation that hey, we have a problem here. This is getting worse in some right. ways from pretty prominent figures. Yeah. Who are who are well respected, and um, and also not just that, but the attack in New you make a point in the piece that half of the hate crimes in New York over in, half uh, over half I think last year, last year. were against against Jews yeah. in New York, yeah. which I wasn't aware of, and also the the bl the black Israelite group when yeah. they killed they killed uh, what four. In Four people in New Jersey, yeah. Yeah, and I remember when that happened, yeah. how little coverage it got, and I'm like, wait a second, there was just basically, you know, I don't yeah. think even basically, an actual massacre of Jews right. in in New York, and there's very little outrage, very little attention. I remember talking to some friends, we probably talked about yeah. it at some point, and I couldn't quite figure out what was good. Something seemed really weird about the overall climate where this was happening, but it wasn't really being talked about. Yeah. You want to, I mean, I think it's really, I, I, I don't want to be too reductionist. I think it's pretty simple. I think it, it's the victims and the perpetrators. Uh, if the perpetrator had been a white nationalist, like the one in Pittsburgh was, then it would have been bigger news. The fact that they were black makes it very difficult for progressives slash liberals slash the mainstream media, increasingly difficult to distinguish at this point, to talk about. Um, and also, Jews are seen as white. And because, again, this woke ideology now is so obsessive about racially categorizing everybody, it, it has categorized Jews as white, and Jews are, and therefore, white Jews are at the top of sort of the um, uh, oppression pyramid, you could say. Uh, I really think it's that simple. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be too simplistic, but I, I really think when, you know, most people in the media, most, um, of kind of the Twitterati come at it from this sort of perspective and they're incapable of seeing any kind of nuance or gray area. But you know, it, I don't know, help me unpack this. I mean, what sort of, it's, it's uh, I don't know, I'm gonna stumble on this because I haven't actually thought it through exactly, but there's something about like rights discourse that I think gets us to here somehow. Like, and I, I mean, we can spin this out thousands of ways, talk about Pompeo's uh, recent, you know, Which I have thing. no problem with. And I actually yeah. think what he's doing is, we, can, we should, we should, talk, we should about talk about that. that. I mean, I, I feel the same way. And, you know, th I think the reaction to that is also somehow telling about this yeah. is, is, now I'm not sure exactly, you know, one thing I was thinking about, Shadi, you signed the letter um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the main pushback and even people who said, oh, I didn't know, you know, who was on the letter. It's J.K. Rowling because she's transphobic, supposedly, and therefore, you know, uh, must be cast out of the discourse. You know, I'm just I'm reading your John Lewis thing and and he identifies Farrakhan and that's like out, you know, beyond the pale of it for him. It's like for for decent humans like mm -hmm. this. This is cast out. But there's something about this sort of like profusion of this rights discourse that 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 like creates these these like everyone's 
cast out. Again, it's like a it's like a, a flight to purity of some sort, right? And it's it's there's something about it's it's a weird thing because it's 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 not more universal. It's kind of like narrowing and sort of creating columns of of victims of some sort. It's, an, it's, it's anti-universalist. In a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, again, you know, it's not Shadi, you've talked about this before. It's like, you know, what 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 speech for you actually is beyond the pale, right? Like where 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 beyond where you, the pale in terms of making it illegal or just no you no one oh, illegal oh, okay. nothing illegal okay. just like you know uh, where where those who should be canceled yeah like who who actually deserves to be canceled because we all have red lines it's a question of where to draw them and I said on on Twitter I think I don't know, maybe yesterday whatever or that I the woke the woke left wants to reduce the Overton window right. To about like forty percent, yeah. As a but themselves, probably even less themselves. Just anyone themselves are further plus to the Ross Douthat. <laughs> well, I don't <laughs> they're know fine about with that. Ross, which is not. An, I think Ross is great, but I think in their minds, and this is very telling, right? Ross Douthat is far more right wing than any of those people on that in that newspaper than Barry Weiss. But Ross Douthat is like this weird Catholic who has all these weird Catholic beliefs, and so like he's not even in their moral universe. Whereas Barry Weiss is like she's within it. she's marrying a woman she's a liberal yeah, yeah. she's Jewish she's cosmopolitan and that is so threatening to them they have to get rid of her. So that's why we've joked it, that Demir can get away with saying things on Twitter yeah. that I could never dream of and I've seen some of the things he's tweeted and I don't want to point or re- I don't want to cause a controversy. <laughs> is that because of your 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 religious ethnic identity or I, I your? Think, or, I think it's because people are like, oh, Demir is lost. Oh, okay. Also, a, right, right, but, right. But here's the interesting thing. I was just about to bring that up. I mean, I think. Also, Shadi, no one knows who I am, so it's that's that's the main problem. But like, <laughs> but but, but Chapo Chapo devotes time to to pillorying Jamie. So why is that? Well, because well, I think I'm, well, maybe because I, I work and I write for institutions that are not explicitly conservative, hmm. and, 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 and you're gay. And well, maybe that's part of it. No, no, but know. you're you're you're. That so, could be. That, yeah, that's probably. Part yeah, of it. conservative gay apostate. So yeah, I'm not I mean, I'm, I'm I really think I'm center right. But center right, yeah, sure, whatever. Fine, but yeah, not like, progressive. Not, not progressive. Yeah. Sure. yeah. No, yeah. Demir is already. I right. was going to say sorry. Uh, I I was about to say something which I shouldn't say. <laughs> Go I was on. Say, is Demir, there anything you shouldn't say? I, I, yeah, yeah. Well, I so. I was going to say Demir is already off the reservation, and I do I I, <laughs> and I should not say that because no, you might get canceled. Oh, that's like the Seinfeld episode. Wait, is, uh, where, where Jerry is dating a Native American woman? Oh, I didn't he, know that was an keeps, episode. Yeah, he keeps on coming across these. And, I, and honestly, I was—I only no. This is not joking. I only became aware of that somewhat recently, and I think it's better to avoid anything that might, uh, yeah, yes, that indeed. might be unnecessarily offensive. Yeah. So, um, which you know is a sign of where there can be progress. That there are certain things that we've all become more aware of. But I think what what is problematic here is um, okay. Yeah. So basically. They want to narrow this to 40% or less of the population right. is acceptable yes. in the Overton window. Yeah. My preference is to expand that to, and I said 98%. Yeah. That's just an approximate number. Yeah. And the, the 2% that I don't include are avowed racists, white supremacists, and terrorists. And this is the difference is that they, you only, by, by your statement right there, you are asserting that only 2% of the population is avowed racist. The people at the New York Times and the people, not just the New York Times, the people who basically run our media now, they, consider they think 50%, per, 50% yeah. of the country or are more. Without, or more. Yeah. And that's such a fundamental difference. That's a recent development, a very recent development. I would say three years old, four years old, th- this just suddenly happened. But now. this is where the word avowed becomes important because when I think about avowed races, that's what I add that qualifier because we're not just talking about people who are racist in effect or an outcome. And this is where well, here's a discourse. It, and this has is changed. what I've noticed too. The term white supremacy used to be a very specific term right. that applied to George Wallace. It applied to David Duke. It applied to people who explicitly supported a legal regime that put white people above people of other different of other races. Okay, so if you supported Jim Crow or you opposed school integration, you were a white supremacist. It, had, it, it was a very specific meaning. And so suddenly when Trump was running or when after he was elected, sometime around then, white, the, the meaning of white supremacy in, inflated and expanded to include all sorts of things now. All sorts of things. Well, and now we've lost the distinction between, you know, that song from Avenue Q, the musical, Everyone's a Little Bit Racist. You know, there are, lots of people have maybe racist impulses yeah. or, or racist prejudices, but there's a difference between that 
And I would say Donald Trump falls into that category. I would say personally, I think Donald Trump is a racist. I yes. think it's fair to say. If he's not a racist, he certainly knows how to appeal to people's. Yeah, but I don't think he's a white supremacist. He's not a white supremacist. No. Yeah. But yeah. to say that. It's controversial. It's controversial. Right, right. It's right. not good enough to say that he's a racist. I think he's. I think the birtherism, and I get into fights with my. And I'll get canceled for this. I have smart, conservative Trump supporting friends. What? <laughs> Wait, Jamie. <laughs> and I actually have this very good, uh, uh, he's an older gentleman and he's a, I, I don't know if he's a Trump supporter, he's Trump sympathetic. And he's always, ran, he's always saying, why do you think that birtherism is racist? Oh. And, I, and I have to explain to him, I'm like, because he's doubting the legitimacy of the first black president. He's saying he's not really an American citizen. He's, he's a, associating he's him with, with foreign, with Africa. And, my, and this guy says back, it's just a conspiracy theory. He's kind of a nut. He would say it against anyone. I don't think the race has anything to do with it. I'm just saying, you know, yeah. that, that me making that argument is not good enough for the woke, right? It has to be that he is no different than George Wallace. Um, and there's a whole suite of opinions that you have to have now, right? So you have to believe that all these institutions and all these policies are inherently systematically racist, right? So now the SAT is, oh, in, is systematically racist. Is, yeah. Um, and there are more controversial things, like the criminal justice system. Are there, I'm not an expert on this, are there aspects of the criminal justice system that are systematically racist, inherently racist? I'm, I'd be willing to entertain that, yes. But I'm not, willing, I'm not willing to go as far as sort of the new, you know, what Wesley Yang calls the successor ideology, that everything has to be yeah. uh, decolonized and, and, and overthrown. And also there's an issue of causality here. I'm, I'm very much someone who believes that the criminal justice system is stacked against black people. Poor and, people. Yeah, yeah. So what I was going to say- Who are disproportionately black. It, it's hard to disentangle the, the, the causal arrows But isn't here. that important? Because um, I think a lot of these policy fixes that we're coming up with, and as a Bernie supporter, I think you would know this, <laughs> a lot of these policy fixes have to do with, do we look at the issue of class or do we look at the issue of race? And I think obviously any, any policy that you adopt- to help people of lower economic classes is going to disproportionately well, disproportionately help, black people, help people, people of color, yeah. and that's and I think that's a perfectly valid argument. But for some reason, that's you have this woke identity side, which is so um, insistent upon the racial aspect of it, which I think is really because I'm sorry, you know, if you're a black reporter at the New York Times, you've got it pretty good in terms yeah. of this in terms of life. I'm not I'm not saying that people don't have hardships, but if you have a job at the New York Times. I don't care what your skin color is. You're doing better than the vast majority of Americans. So the notion that, you know, someone in that position is somehow, you know, worse off than a white guy in Appalachia who has no job and, remember, and has no future. And there was this article in the New York Times about, uh, it was a black author who yes, said that right. he wasn't sure if he'd see his book come out. Right. And then Thomas Chatterton Williams. Speaking of Thomas, I, you know, I was, I'm not really on Twitter anymore, but I, I think I noticed yesterday on Twitter, they're going after him now. Oh, God. They're yeah, going yeah, after yeah, his memoir time. that he wrote. Um, because, they're going deep into it. Yeah, his which tweet. is, again, like you mentioned earlier, like, you know, as being gay and not, you know, not part of the kind of bien pensant world. I think Thomas clearly is now being subjected to this. He's also a he's fighter. A, and I he's think, a black man yeah, who thinks and, for himself. And I'm glad and to see him, you know, fighting back on this. And, but it shows you how hard it is when you have colleagues at the publications he writes for, openly attacking him on Twitter because he's not sufficiently black, whatever that means. Yeah, which, which is kind of racist. I would say so. Yes. I would say It's so. like when people call me a native- Right, uh, native, native informant. Yeah. Do they call you that? <laughs> okay, yeah. Or um, uh, I was going to say a rootless bootlicker, but that's, a, that's oh. a mix of two different things. No, I think it's actually an imperialist bootlicker. I, I, well, I've that's true. Oh, yeah. But here's an interesting question. Are there policies, if you're gay, Muslim, black, are there policies that, if you did support, would put your bona fides into question? Yeah, I mean, right. that's already my situation. People attack me a lot. No, but I'm saying, are there a, is there a policy that, if, like, for instance, if a Muslim supported the Muslim ban, would that be fair to call him a hypocrite, right? Or, like, if a gay person didn't support gay marriage? I actually think there are... I, I know gay people who have not supported them. Maybe they've changed well, their minds. Or, you know, a, a black person who opposes, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something really basic and simple. Like, yeah, yeah, but I, w I wouldn't call that person a native informant. I would just say they have really bad views. There are presumably... You don't think it's fair to go after them as a... As a, as a Race traitor. As a, as a, yeah, as sort of a traitor to their people. I would go after in any circumstance. A, a Muslim supporter of, of the Muslim ban. I would go after someone like that by saying, hey... 
this is hurting Muslims and you're supporting that, right. I wouldn't want to get into ad hominem yeah. because I just don't like, I don't think that's the way we should approach disagreement. Are there legitimate reasons to support the Muslim ban that someone could conceivably justify? I'd, I'd be willing to kind of hear that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mince words and pretend that, hey, if you're a Muslim and you're proud of your Muslim identity and you care about the welfare of your fellow Muslim citizens, if someone um, can't have a relative if they're an American citizen, but they have relatives who aren't American citizens from Yemen, let's say, who can't come to the U.S. and visit them, or, um, I mean, that affects American citizens, and I'd want to hear an answer to how they justify that, but I wouldn't want to use language, the native informant, mm. that, that's very, I feel like that gets us into a very dark place, mm. and I, I assume there's, there's similar analogs when well, it I'm comes to black. I'm asking this because I'm writing my chapter on the 80s, my gay Washington book, and there's obviously, this is the question that arises with sort of gay conservatives or gays working in the Reagan administration during it, the AIDS crisis, and the outing became a phenomenon at that point, so this is something that I'm kind of But there are defensible reasons for a gay person to oppose gay marriage from a religious standpoint. If someone is an Orthodox Catholic, for example, um, the position of the Catholic Church yeah. is still not in support of gay marriage. I would agree with you, but there are yeah. lots of people who would not. And, um, I mean, I'll just, you know, since we're talking about canceling, I, I actually signed an open letter before it was cool. In 2014, I don't know if you remember this, there was a guy named Brandon Ike, who was yeah, some of sort of computer oh. guy and... He was on the board of Mozilla. He created Mozilla Firefox, you know, the, yeah. the web browser. And he had given, I think, $1,000 to the campaign in Florida, uh, sorry, to the campaign in California against gay marriage. He wasn't gay. He was maybe religious or conservative. Okay. I don't know what it was. He gave $1,000. And he was kind of the first person to be canceled. There was a huge uproar. Oh, he was actually canceled. He was oh, can yeah. he, they kicked him off the board of this, of this company, M M uh, Mozilla. Mozilla. For having a legitimate policy disagreement? He didn't even, he didn't like bring it to the work, to work. He it just sent, came out. They, because it's an FEC, right? You, you, you give $1,000 and it's reported. Yeah, and it came out. I was not a, this and is they went after him. Yeah. yeah, and they got, and I actually signed it. There was an open letter. It was organized. You know, Andrew Sullivan signed. It was all gay writers and intellectuals and Jonathan Rausch and, you know, the usual suspects, and I signed it. And that was 2014. And we were making the case as gay people, as gay supporters of gay marriage, that people who we disagree with should not have this happen to them because this is a live political issue in this country and we should be able to debate it without fear of losing your job. And I'm sorry to say that no one listened to us because clearly things have gotten I'm surprised worse that, since that letter that's came a, out. I mean, I'm surprised that that case hasn't come up more because that sounds like a It's very kind of the case. ground zero, I think, of kind of canceling, really. Yeah, it was yeah. when this all kind of, because, you know, 2014, I feel like is when everything kind of snapped in this well, country. Well, so along similar That was Ferguson, yeah. and then the following year was the Yale Halloween costume oh, right. crisis, I remember that. and then Trump, and then it just kind of all got worse. And this is why I think that even if there was a Muslim who supported Trump's Trump's ban, I would be very opposed to that, but I would never think to myself, this person should lose his or her job. That's where there's a, a sort of leap um, that that is seem, it feels foreign to me. Why I would need, why I would feel compelled to try to deprive someone of his or her livelihood. So I, th I think the, the gay experience is in interesting here when, when it comes to outing and, you know, what are the ethics of outing someone? And I generally almost always oppose it. I think you can make an exception if there's a politician or a public figure who is using their bully pulpit to really hurt gay people. In those cases, I would say fine. Hmm. But, you know, for just like the staffer on a Republican senator's staff, you know, like the legislative aide or the even the chief of staff maybe, I think, and this was something that happened a lot in like the early 2000s during the Bush years. I remember, you know, left and right, they were outing people who were gay and worked for Republicans on the Hill. And I think that's wrong. Because I think you can agree with someone on 90% of the issues and on this 10% you don't. And that could apply to any issue, not just gay issues. I mean, there are all sorts of issues. And if you're working for someone, it shouldn't be assumed that you would support them. And so I, you know, I, I oppose outing in those cases. And I'm not sure where the mood is now. It's probably gotten worse, I would think, so in terms of the, the, yeah. the general attitude uh, among activists. But I think there's a difference between the gay community, quote unquote, I think the average gay person would probably agree with me. The activists don't, and I think that applies to a lot of this stuff. Well, everything has become activist, I too, think, right? I think on Black Lives Matter and racial issues, you have this white, woke problem. Right. And you have some very high-profile black activist writer types who are not in league or, or with the black community, so to speak. I think with a trans issue, I think you have some very outspoken trans activists 
who want to cancel J.K. Rowling and who want to, you know, basically, uh, and who also believe in certain aspects of the trans ideology that, frankly, I think a lot of uh, um, rank and file trans people don't agree with. And I think this is across every community now, and I think it, social media just makes it that well, much worse. So, so let me just like pull you guys a little back on this because you know, so guys, there, there's a lot to talk about. One thing that struck me, Shadi, you were saying um, uh, off the reservation and then like, oh, well, you caught yourself and it's like, well, progress, right? You, you actually called it progress, like that, that now I you've caught that. yourself. You did. You said this is maybe a kind of progress that you caught yourself. But, you know, I think that's wrong because what we're talking mm. about, it's not moral. I think there's like there's such a mm. like messed up thing about categories. I don't think this is moral progress. It's called manners, you know, like basically we're, we've maybe upgrading our manners. I remember we had one of our staffers at the magazine. Um, it was around the time when like the Internet was going nuts over trigger warnings, you know, and and um, he was a, a young conservative guy, young conservative Catholic. And we were all like all of, you know, all the sort of more free speech libertarians in the office were all like going bananas over this, ah, you know, snowflakes, et cetera. And he said, you know what? I'm not that upset about the idea of trigger warnings as such. He said, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens and especially with social media, it's the stripping away of something that we used to have just like politeness and manners, like social niceties have, have gone away. Now, I don't fully agree with all of that, but I think it's like there's something about this, about the category of morals seeping into everything. And this is like getting back to what I was trying to sort of get at. Now, fair enough, you know, uh, obviously there are lines uh, and there are things that 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 are beyond the what of acceptable discourse and shoddy defines it at, you know, 98 percent. And the Wokies define it at like much narrower things. I guess what's bothering me about it is not so much that because in a way that's arbitrary. Um, and okay, we can have fights about that. It's it's that I think there's like there's there's a and Shadi and I have talked about this before. There's there's a kind of moral fervor to it. There's a religious fervor yeah. to all of this, which is deeply unhealthy. Yeah. It's this. It's you know. I mean, one could even say that it's displaced religion in an increasingly secularized world, and it's it's like leading to this sort of thing. So I don't know. Maybe maybe it ends up being healthy. I mean, I think the hippies were also sort of you know uh, uh, displaced religious fervor in a way, and that sort of you know weird cult like behavior that in the seventies they ended up going off to these communes and you know mass suiciding. But the, 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 to me, that is what's so irritating about this moment is the, is the, the haughty morality of yes, it all. Yes. And it's because it's somehow all this discourse is like now boiled down to moralizing. So I don't think not saying off the reservation is, is progress in any moral sense. It's like, okay, you're a little more aware and we don't want to offend, you know, people that might take offense on this. Should they take offense in this? Okay, if they take offense of it, that should be enough, and let's not offend people. I think that's a good that's a good limit. I don't see that. It that's depends like, what if yeah, it's in the eye of the, of the beholders, and it, because sure. apparently, according to a lot of the staff of the New York Times, their lives were put in danger. Right, right. By an op-ed. Now that is racial blackmail. Right. That's those, what those reporters did was racial blackmail. Right. And so you have there has to be some. I don't know if it's an objective standard, but I think there's a difference between, you know, if that's offensive to a lot of Native Americans to say something like that, fine. But I'll be damned if publishing an op-ed like that's Tom That's why Cotton's, I would add a, a qualification within reason. Who and, defines yeah, well, what's that, in reason? That's part of the and this problem. Is, and this is why I think this whole notion of free speech is misleading. Something, it, it used to be we had editors who were liberal. They were Democrats. Yeah. You know, most editors of every major publication going back many years you know, Esquire magazine to Life to the New York Times. Why they were all liberal? Okay, Ben Bradley was a liberal. Okay, they were all liberals, and they had a small L. They 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 were big L capital yeah. liberals. They were they voted Democrat, but they were also small L liberals, and they were able to uh, weigh different viewpoints and to invite them into their publications. And then we are not dealing with that anymore. We're dealing with people who are who are religious who are political activists first before they are journalists, yeah. and they see their role as that of political activism. I don't think that they, this is Wesley Lowry basically being open mm. about this, calling for moral clarity in reporting, whatever yeah. that means. Um, but it's like so, journalists shouldn't be, shouldn't believe in progress in some weird way. I feel like the, the, the real, the, like the good pose of a journalist is a sense of, I think, right but not progress, if that makes sense. Like a good journalist yeah. should feel, should like point out 
like where the big guy is fucking the little guy. And that should be like the driving righteousness of journalism. It's mm -hmm. like, it's to point this kind of fucked up shit up and be like, not good, shine a light on it. Well, you're you know? right, because progress, progress is an ideological posture that is anything but neutral. Yeah. Right. But what, I mean, what, what journalists should do is is something like like you said there's a distinction between um truth to whatever it is right yeah truth sure to power and but actually having a teleological um conception of the of, good of the good awful is a very distinct ideological pose which has major implications on everything and if that is how you go into your journalism then I'm sorry you're not a journalist you can't be a journalist and you know who else talked about moral clarity Hitler <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say George W. Bush, but hey. Uh, okay, well, so Hitler's come up. We have to stop the podcast, right? It's like fucking Godwin's Law podcast. No, um, but I, I think, I think that's that that like sort of gets it for me. Is is the moralizing about it? And and you know, again, the other thing you were saying, uh, Jamie, at some point. Um, about the other thing that's been inverted in all of this, and like again, I think that that somehow liberalism has been turned on its head, and it's complicated because of the class thing. It's the question of uh, uh, equality of opportunity versus equality of outcomes, right? And it, that's bedeviled by race in this country because mm -hmm. again, this is where sort of systemic racism and the rest of this, you know complicates this narrative in a big way because the legacy of slavery has clearly disadvantaged uh, a class of people mm -hmm. and they are, you know, because poverty then also ends mm -hmm. up perpetuating itself. Yeah. It's, um, but then it's a question of, I think, again, the importance of getting morality out of this as much as possible. Now, again, that's really hard to say. I don't know if you saw Walter's book review, but uh, uh, he reviewed a book that talked about reparations and you sort oh, of tried yeah. to give it a, you know, Walter Mead of the Wall Street yeah. Journal. It was a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Walter ends up at this place. He says, you know, uh, the, the really horrific thing is, we, you know, we tried the Great Society. We tried right. everything. Right. Um, we tried the best that the sort of mid-century liberalism and like mid to end century liberalism could offer. Uh, you look at the statistics, uh, it hasn't budged the statistics in any meaningful way. And he, he approaches the question of reparations in a way to say that I am deeply skeptical that this will make any difference, but everything else has failed. So what are we going to do? But still, it seems to me on some level, uh, it's by injecting or inverting this opportunity, equality of opportunity versus equality of outcomes that somehow morality sneaks into this thing. I'm not saying we can't have a moral discourse on this. I just feel like in so many of our debates, once you, you inject morality in it, it becomes zero sum. It becomes uh, righteous beyond debate. Like, and, and that to me is, is the root of some no, of this Demir, poison. I, I'm fine with injecting morality. It's just that my conception of morality is fundamentally different. I don't think the way to address this is to say morality has no place in the conversation because that seeds the ground to them that they are somehow the moral actors in this. In Who's them? The, the wokes, wokes, the wokes, the woke lefties or whatever. I mean, I think my, my views on this are intimately tied to my moral convictions and also to my belief in God. And I, you know, I've talked about this quite a bit. So I don't want, I mean, but it's just a very different way of looking at morality. So the, um, my views about individualism that I don't want to be judged or presumed to think anything because I'm of a certain color or a certain religion, that has to do with my monotheism, this idea that um, we are ultimately accountable to only one thing, and that is an ultimate power. For me, that's God. For other people, it could be other things. And God ultimately judges us not based on our group attributes or group affinity, but based on our individual deeds. That is the ultimate case for individualism and individual responsibility, individual accountability. That's, that's sort of a problem I have with this sort of collective uh, guilt or blame that I think is now being foisted upon us, this notion that you know, all white people have to you know, wash the feet of random black people or apologize or whatever. You know, if I've been racist to an individual person or to a race of people, then I will make amends for that. But the notion that, you know, anyone of that particular s 
skin color has to do this or has to think that way or has to receive this because of their skin it's color mind, it's mind. or has to have that taken away from them and given to someone else because of their skin color. I find that really problematic. It's not just that it's problematic. It's that it's Evil? so, it's so self evidently <laughs> wrong that I think in a previous time we wouldn't even give it the time of day, com- like as a conversation, we would just all assume as reasonable right. people who want to do good that it was unacceptable to talk about right. people in such a manner. But now you have books that are arguing this at the top of the New York Times bestseller yeah. list. And but again, careful, though, the reparations debate is old. This is not new. It's not like Ta-Nehisi invented reparations or something like that. I mean, it goes back, I think, to the 90s and like even but before there are, then, right? But there are levels of the reparations argument. Sure. There are people who would say, um, you know, only direct descendants of right. slaves and you should only take things maybe from people who have... Not, not even from the government. It should come from individuals who can right. trace I, mean, I don't know. There's, there's d- different- No, of course. There's many. I, there's I, the, yeah. I, I'm, I'm deeply ignorant of the entire sort of literature, so I'm not going to even go there. I'm just saying it, it's-, it's, it's uh, Demir is a reparations expert. <laughs> I, I'm putting that on my CV. <laughs> reparations expert, Demir Marusic. It's be good. Um, okay, but one thing I do, before I forget, I do want to bring up before we, we go in a very different direction. Um, I remembered a little anecdote. I was with someone- uh, a good friend who I've had a lot of conversations about this sort of thing. Uh, and I was surprised that at some point I mentioned, she was she was making some comment about how the lack of diversity with the Democratic candidates. Mm. And I'm like, well, wait a second here. Bernie Sanders would have been the first Jewish president in American history. And I swear to God, I thought she was trolling me. She literally was like, wait, Bernie's Jewish. I didn't know. And the, this is uh, this is a very intelligent, well-read person. We've and really assimilated no, in this I, country. I have to say. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, she, and yeah. she was like, I just, I just assumed he was a white guy. <laughs> okay, I mean, his skin and, but, is white. But yeah, I mean, but this got to the bigger issue here that I actually, I know, not everyone cares about. It. Actually, very few people care about it. The the the, um, the making the the equivalency of um, Jews, a, a Jews white. with, with whiteness mm. has sort of caught me off guard. And I find it kind of odd. I grew up assuming or knowing we were like, oh yeah, Muslims are a minority. Arabs are a minority. Right. Jews are a minority. Yeah. And that was just taken for granted. Or, were Italians a minority? <laughs> No, I'm serious. I mean, they I'm were saying, when they when they first they were came. when they first not, arrived. Not, but like in your mind, not no. When I was growing up, yeah, no, we did not talk about Italians as a minority because they had already. And maybe this gets to the point about what, when do you stop being or be, being a minority? But I feel like Jew, you know, um, because of the history of oppression, there's also a certain I think um, acknowledgement that people who have suffered for very long periods of time, there's there's a reason that we consider that Jews are a minority. I, I don't know. Maybe this is where I'm struggling because the, the views have shifted on this. Mm. And um, because the oppression is quite recent. Mm, yeah. And in, you know, in certain parts of the world, including in Western Europe, anti-Semitism has yeah. actually increased, yeah. right? So to pretend that anti-Semitism in Western democracies is no longer a thing is also problematic on its own terms. But, but, here, look. So, Jamie, let me ask you this question because I think even what Shadi's saying right here, it's it's interesting. I think the the the, the tell right is that uh, the civil rights movement and the status of blacks in America is in many ways unique. Of course, it is. And the interesting thing is that all the subsequent rights movements have patterned themselves on the civil rights movement, yes. including the gay rights Absolutely. movement. Absolutely. Um, how do you feel about that? Is that a good move? Again, like this gets back to my question about like rights taking over everything in a way. Like, and and in a way y- you look at it and what we have here is a kind of natural outcome of everything being a civil mm. rights movement. Right. Where in fact, blacks, I think, do have a unique claim to a unique kind of right. oppression. Right. And it's like oppression discourse then takes over. Now, this is not to say in any way that like, Jews, A, when they came here as immigrants, were not despised. Yeah. Not to say that anti-Semitism was not a real thing in America. Of course it was. Not to say in any way that the unique nature of the Holocaust yeah, is yeah. not a unique horror in, in, in like Western and human history. However, it's, it's that it's the 
fucking rights discourse somehow that I think is polluting all of this. Is this sort of the Christopher Cal- Caldwell argument that you're making? <laughs> you know, you know I'll tell you what, though. Like, Caldwell's book makes me uncomfortable, like, in a lot of ways. Isn't it like a fashy book? Yeah. He, no, I, he says that the Civil Rights Act was a mistake. See, there oh, I don't wow. go. Okay. See, there I, I don't go. But, like, that to me doesn't seem like... I think, like, the Civil Rights Act is perfectly fine. I think it's, just the, the only... I think it was just the Civil Rights Act that had to do with private discrimination. Mm-hmm. So voting rights, I think he's fine with. I don't know. I haven't read the book, but I think the argument he makes is it's, you should be able to discriminate privately. So, you know, yeah. lawyers and whatnot. Yeah. You know, again, like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not sure how this world that, that I, I've only read reviews. I haven't read the book, but I, it's never been clear to me how this world that Chris would like to be would yeah. actually function right. without racism. And that yeah. to me, that to me is where I really don't like what I'm yeah. saying. So the argument I'm making is that one needs to sort of contain the rights discourse. And this is what I was, you know, I, I, was, I was saying to you before we started, um, and I was talking to, to uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, yesterday, and we're just sort of, you know, riffing on a lot of this stuff. And, and we're talking about, uh, you know, all the different podcasts and products and all this energy that's coming out and, and Yasha Monk's persuasion. And, and like, he was sort of expressing a certain kind of, um, I don't know, Irritation's not too strong. He 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 likes the moment and he likes that Yasha's on top of it somehow. But like what like irritates him, irritates him a little bit is is this sort of again a pretension to universality somehow and this over moralizing. Mm. I don't know. I don't know how else to put it. And it's like there's something. What what I want is is like almost called like liberal exceptionalism or like liberal particularism of some sort. That it's like obviously. There obviously human rights exist. Like Pompeo's thing says, obviously human rights exist. These are universal yeah. values, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not that everything's a fucking right, right. and not everything's a yes. fucking universal right. And that to me is where we've gone off the fucking deep end. And here's recently. where I think you're really onto something, Demir. When you texted me earlier with this distinction, I'm like, I think this is why we agree so much. Yeah. Because you and I are ultimately, we believe in the particular. Yeah. We believe in the power of the particular. I'm also in some ways a universalist, but in a limited sense, I don't think everyone is liberal or should be liberal. But you, So you would agree with the Pompeo, with the State Department, uh, what they're doing, because they're basically saying these rights are very specific rights. It's the right to freedom of worship and religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, co- conscience yeah. um, individual rights these economic and social rights. No, but I don't even believe individual rights are as universal in that oh, sense. Because okay. I think there are, there are major objections to the idea that there is um, somewhat unlimited free speech. I mean, we can have a whole debate about, you know, blasphemy, for example, cartoon, prophet right. uh, um, attacking the character of the prophet yeah. is a debate, obviously, in, in various Muslim majority countries. And in that sense, they, I don't think it's right to call these universal values insofar as they're not universally universally held. I mean, there there is still room for debate about where you draw the line legally. We have, I mean, Europe certainly has legal restrictions on speech when it comes to Holocaust yeah. denialism yeah. and so on. So, to, I mean, uh, this is these are all things that sh- that should be openly debated. They're not settled. And I think this pr- pretension to treating certain debates as settled right. before they are right. settled yeah. worries me a little bit. So does that explain the kind of liberal fury at what at what Pompeo is doing? Yeah, is that, is I that think so. I he's think not so. acknowledging that you know the right to health care is not that, a right. No, precisely. You can have a policy belief that everyone should have health care, right. but the notion that it should rank up there with the right to you know stand on a street corner with a sign – is false. No, I, that, I mean, I might my, my, uh, extend even further. This is why, I mean, again, I'm not sure Pompeo could produce any right. kind of, anyone from the Trump administration could produce any kind of document on anything like this that would not <laughs> like automatically cause outrage. Right. But I think that's right. It's because it goes up against the entire, what's entirely wrong with the whole woke thing is the, the rightification of everything. Yeah. Yeah. And and that it's that a good like term rightification the rightification mm. and it, it's it's the it's the it's the creation of again the 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 nasty thing about our current moment is that underlying the Black Lives Matter thing I think are real yeah. serious grievances mm-hmm. that are based in race and a very special category 
and glommed onto it is this like Marxist superstructure yes. of insanity, right. of moralizing rights discourse, and just it, I think it's bad. It's really bad because it's gotten all muddled on like all levels of this sort of thing. What yeah. it does is it um, anathematizes any view that's contrary. Right. So, right? so now that's you right. now if you oppose universal health care, you're not just it's not just a legitimate policy disagreement. You're an evil person. Yeah, that's because right. it's a right. Yeah. It's a right to have health care. Right. It's a right to have a home. Yeah. It's a right to only work five days a week, whatever the whole I, list I mean, that they have. You remember, I mean, I, I believe there's there's a right to work clause in some European like constitution, if I'm not mistaken. I'm like sure like that, you know, I mean that's there's also there should also be a right to not work. Sure. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, yeah, Sl slavery, right? That's the right. I mean, sl slavery. Wait, what? Well, slavery is forcing people to work, so you should have a right. Oh not yeah, to yeah, work, you're, right. you're agreeing with me, yeah, sort of. Course, yeah. 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 yeah, but I mean, <laughs> um, but it, what it comes down to is the criminalization yeah. of what should otherwise be legitimate policy differences, right? And this is why I think there's a fundamental asymmetry to all this. When I think about the woke folks. I want to coexist with them in mainstream institutions. That is a legitimate view that should be there. They don't return the favor, though. They see me as someone to be pushed out, that I am, I am a you're threat. So, you're so victimizing yourself. All this oh, yeah, that's also, talk. I mean. But so, luckily, so let me, uh, yeah. go on. No, but but the, the, there's something unequal there, because if we want to coexist with them, because we believe in a very it wide makes, Overton it window. It makes us chumps is what it does, I think. Yeah, we're not willing. I mean, it makes us chumps. I don't think we realize, and I think this starts, frankly, with the well-intentioned liberals. And you see uh, an analogy with what happened in the late 1960s on university campuses, very similar. Yeah. At all these institutions, you have well-intentioned liberals who claim to believe in free discourse and free, you know, in whatever. And then what happens? They get confronted by a mob of woke whether it's New York Times reporters or students, hard to tell the difference, yeah. and, they, and they collapse. Yeah. And they just don't have the cojones to say, you're wrong. And the irony is that they were once the victims of cancel culture. If we want to talk about why freedom of speech has been so important. It's, it's to protect so important. the left. Some, and the marginalized. And the marginalized, more generally. absolutely. And it was pro-Palestine voices yep. Who, was who were targeted and, yeah. you know, yeah. and so now they're saying now that they're in power, right. they want to essentially do what others were doing. But to is them. that, is that not a, um, from just a purely power perspective on their part, does it not make, I mean, just to take the morals out of it, take, take, yeah. uh. They, they probably think we own these institutions now. That's we right. got Yale. We they got may, Harvard. We got the New York Times. So it, we're never going to be threatened again. We don't have the the White House yet, well, so, but, so that, that but gets, we have the New York Times. So why now that we've conquered the New York Times and every other media institution, why should we give it up? Well, that, that's actually an interesting question. I mean, if you look at this fundamentally uh, from the standpoint of power relations. Which is what I think you have to do. So then, that's how they see it. That's how they case. see it. That's they don't their... see it. People don't go to work at the New York Times anymore because they want to report on news events. You know, like old fashioned, just like what happened. You know, who, what, where, how. That's what. You, that's what you used to go to be a journalist, a, a news yeah, reporter. Yeah, they're not. That's not what the Times does anymore, and that's not why people want okay, to work at so the Times. So, if it's fundamentally about power, then where does that leave us? I mean, let's. I don't think that they think they're being totally. I know. I know some of them probably deep down know exactly what they're doing, and I don't want to name names. I think they know what they're doing. Yeah, there are others who want to retain this uh, pat, uh, patina. <laughs> I Go love ahead. it. They're all, so this is one reason I like this podcast because the it's words, speech therapy for, the for words shoddy. That, the words that I would just write because no, I've never heard a real person <laughs> say patina or patina, patina. So I don't, actually don't know what it yeah. sounds like, yeah. but I can bring it up on the podcast in a non-threatening safe <laughs> environment yeah. and no one will judge me. No, 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 no I'm one quiet. will. I'm silently judging <laughs> No, but so so you know, uh, I you know I, the 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 three of us are at, on, on a, a fun small group chat, and I, you know I it's, it sort of comes up every so often. Um, the paradox, right, is shoddy is that 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 you said it earlier, like whatever. I can say much more horrible things. They come after you. They come after Jamie too. But you're much more famous than me. But like <laughs> it's it's it's. How worried are you about your side, Shadi? I mean, like, I know Jamie's worried about the country because of what's happening. I'm a little bit more passive about this. I'm just like, you know, 
watch the carnival as it un- 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 unfolds. I, I kind of mock your side. Like that's yeah. my pose is like gentle mocking of the, the idiocy of this. And I think it's going to ruin itself because I don't think the country is actually even close to being where your side is. How are you even looking at this? Like your side, you know, talk so, to me. Tell a me what, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, it's funny, right? It's the the thing that that like most of us have been joking about. Like most of you lefties on that on that Harper's letters, that you're the neo neocons. You're going to be yeah. the ones that are going to get thrown out, and you'll end up conservative in in some weird way because you have no home. I mean, it's it's a funny little inflection of the sort of never Trumpers who or yeah, neo conservatives so, like thrown out of the Trump party. But I think well, so. How you how are you how are you experiencing this? Well, that's why I think. It's mattered more to me than perhaps to other people because I see it as an intra-left struggle and it's one that I think should be won by the right side, although I hesitate to use that language because I think part of the problem is that this presumption that there is a right side, I mean, we ultimately have to coexist. The left should be pluralistic enough to have different kinds of left. Um, but and, certain fights end up being zero sum yeah, yeah. Well, because so, of the ideology of one side. In that at case, least, we're yeah. going to have to, you know, fight the fight in a, in a respectful way. And I'll, you know, and I, I don't want to engage in ad hominem with the problematic folks on the other side of this divide. But I mean, that's why we felt the Harper's letter was important because yeah. we thought it was um, relevant and important to have a coordinated show of force to say that we are out here yeah. and we believe in certain things and we're not going to apologize for them. So that's part of part of I think the the obligation for for all of us who think this is important. And I think that now that we've said what we had to say, more people who would otherwise feel vulnerable, um, aspiring graduate students, journalists who felt that they couldn't actually speak truthfully about what they hold to be true. They know that there are those of us in, in mainstream institutions who will defend them and that we, we share their views. That's important on its own. I don't know if it's going to change everything. I don't know if it's going to be enough. It's like Radio Free Europe broadcasting over the Iron <laughs> Curtain. You know, or, or right to, or yeah, Sami's dot publication, which makes so it actually it, sound somewhat. I mean, ultimately, we no, know I really, I'm not being sarcastic. Yeah. I do think it served that role for a lot of, you know, like, like you said, grad students or people I mean, who are I mean, people who don't have the luxury of the platforms that you know I mean, you Jamie, have or I, I have. Or, I don't want to compare myself to a freedom fighter <laughs> under a communist dictatorship. Well, but you know, this I mean, is, I, I actually <laughs> think that in certain look, obviously, it's not comparable. But in sort of rarefied examples, I mean, if you are an academic and that's your career, if you are anything, n- never mind conservative, they don't exist in academia. Yeah. If you are just an old fashioned liberal in yeah. certain departments and your entire livelihood is dependent upon your career, you know, like, you know, uh, what you produce and whatnot, I don't think it's that different than being a writer at a communist well, newspaper look. being told what to write. Well, and no, being, but, and, and, but, and you could be fired over the or the, over the smallest infraction. You, you know, it's just been funny to watch for me, like in the, at the magazine, like working at this sort of stuff. And you know, we we get we ran a, a piece by Jamie not too long ago, excellent piece. But the you know, lost honor of Sue Schaefer, right? Where I actually made the comparison. You made the comparison, and 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 as you know, we went through an editing process, and it was about like refining that comparison because on the one hand, you don't want to say you know it's, like it's that exact, it's the exact same thing. Of so so we got the language right. But what's funny to me is that like you know certain people at the magazine like since then have been like, holy shit, what the fuck's going on in this country? It's like, gotten worse. It's gotten but worse. I, actually say, I would actually say there's there is an element about this that is worse. Yeah. Than communist dictatorships, which is that we are doing this to ourselves. Right. There is no government coercion yeah. involved in any of this. Yeah. Which is my problem that I had with the Harper's letter was sort of the throat, the anti-Trump throat clearing. And I think I would agree, actually. And I three years ago I wouldn't have agreed, certainly, when I was a, you know, I still am a never Trumper, but when I was a real hardcore never Trumper, I don't think Donald Trump is the biggest threat to democracy in this country. Hmm. You know why? He's gonna be gone in three months. Yeah. And you know what's gonna happen? We're still gonna be stuck with our liberal cultural institutions being com- being controlled by uh, Maoists. But, but that's, I, but still gonna, that's still going to exist. But I do think that the compromise language was that he was, I can't remember exactly, but it was something like a great threat to democracy okay. instead of the greatest. existential. Uh, okay. I mean, it could, have, it, it could have been, from my standpoint, more problematic, and I, I did have a concern about that. 
So, but I mean, if you want to bring people on the left together, um, you have to, of you have you to speak to and the I, threat that Trump poses. Yeah. But I will say that, I mean, half But of, I don't think Donald Trump has been, in terms of freedom of speech or press freedom, I really don't think he's been that much of a threat. He's been a boon for the New York Times. Oh, yeah, for the New York Times, And, and, for and sure. cable news and pretty much everyone. I think Ronan Farrow has done more to hurt freedom of, of discourse in this country with what he did to Woody Allen getting his book contract scotched. Oh, I mean, come that, on. Compare, Wait, but, but who's, that, whose book contract? But, Donald Trump, it's been, it's been a million book contracts have bloomed under Donald Trump. But the book's no, he has not like, I mean, that's not necessarily. Fine, but that, but excuse me, but that was part of, and I'm surprised as a, as a <laughs> signer of the Harper's letter that you wouldn't see why this is a problem. It's not free speech. Oh. Order. It's, it's a culture that's being created when one influential person, in this case, Ronan Farrow, with a single tweet can get an entire publishing house, can get all these ridiculous editorial assistants to walk out in protest over a book he doesn't like. That is a really bad precedent. And when you can do it to someone as powerful, I'm sorry, Woody Allen isn't that powerful. They tried to do it to um, uh, J.K. Rowling a couple months ago, no, and obviously right. you can't cancel her. I, mean, I, think there, I think there were some people at her literary yeah, but, agency. But, but, who tried but I to, do yeah. think that her repu- she is suffering she real is, reputation. Which is fine. Risk. People like your reputation should not be something that is in, in, inviolable right. in, yeah. in, a, in a democracy. But I think Absolutely, the yeah. the precedent that was set with the Woody Allen thing to me is frankly more dangerous. I'm trying to think of what Donald Trump has done to hurt the media. Yeah, he said the media is the enemy of the people. Okay. If he just said well, CNN, to hurt the country, I maybe I maybe you agree. Know. <laughs> I maybe agree with you on his, what he's done to the media, which isn't that much. But I think there is a legitimate case to be made that Trump has hurt the country. Of course, he in has. Really oh, profound absolutely, ways. he has. I'm just, I'm yeah, but I agree with you. But I not, hate it when journalists get all because I've you know you've been I've been to countries where yeah, freedom of speech and press they're is, being silly. I've met journalists who go to jail for doing okay. So to see people like Jim Acosta or or reporters at the Times or the or the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press, actual non uh, NGOs, you know, rank us lower on press freedom because he gives stu- yeah. stupid the, tweets. These, he said it's, they it's, they want to believe that they're fighting some epic battle for ridiculous. freedom, pretending right. that America isn't a democracy. And it's frankly, propo- it's, it's propo- disrespectful yes. to anyone who's lived yes. under an actual authoritarian regime. It's intellectual it's, vanity, is what it is. It's intellectual mass, but it's also yeah. dumb. And wrong. Well, yeah. It's yeah, not just sure. vanity. It's just it's not. It's not analogous. Living right. in America is not like living in Egypt. Right. I can guarantee yeah. you that. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> but I'll also say just so I don't forget it. What, but this goes back to the point. This yeah. is why I think the left is more of a much more of a threat no, to free speech well, than the right. Well, Where are the examples of right wing speech suppression? It's few and far no, between. No, but there has been right a couple. I mean. There are some conservative outlets, yeah, that have that have gone pro Trump. Okay, I mean, but also professors who were seen as too leftist, and they were kind of sure, like pushed that, out. Yes, that, that is happened. definitely happening. But yes, that is definitely happening. I would think on a much smaller scale than the opposite. Yeah, I mean, look, Fire, which is a great organization, catalogs all this, yeah. and I think it's pretty. That's be, but that's because conservatives don't have power in these institutions. Right. One one might wonder if they did. Let's say well, we that know it, they did. We know in the nineteen forties and the nineties, and you'd think the left would be more attuned to this. We know. Yeah. That people on the left, communists or just socialists, were were oppressed for their for their ideas. That happened. That, that was McCarthyism, was it not? That was happening on university campuses. So yeah, of course, historically, it was certainly more often than the left. I just, I just think now, now for it's sure. more often. I think you're right, and and um, but maybe this gets gets to a fundamental point that back to the power relations issue. That if you you know the history, you know that whoever's in power uses their power sure. accordingly to suppress speech to some extent. And you say, hey, let me be practical about that. Now we're in the ascendance as the woke left. Let's make the most of this opportunity because we believe that what we believe is right in some total sense and let us do what must be done. And if it, and I, I, if people are straight up about that, I, I, I'm scared of that. I'm just saying right. that if, if that's the way that you look at the world and you understand that that's the way the world works. So precisely, and this is why, this is why, you know, let me return to my question to you. This is exactly the question I have for you. Uh, and we're coming up to our hour. We're already a little beyond it. So let me just say this. Um, Shadi. Yes. Uh, the question to you is exactly that, is that assume that, you know, this is what happens because it's a, it's, it's a, you know, as you would like to call it, perhaps an agonistic sort of fight 
over, well, it's not agonistic because Chantal Mouffe likes to talk about actually recognizing the other side. It's an antagonistic fight. They don't for, believe in the other side so, doesn't believe in agonism. I right. do. They don't. No, so, so the fact is then, but this is a reality. We've seen it happen on the other side before. Now it's happening on this side. Are you ever going to abandon your side? But That's well, my but question to you. Even, but I, how can I stop being what I am? Well, because what you are is being, or at least like how one identifies, that is the story you're of being, neoconservatism. You're being defined out of- You're being I'm defined not, out of your side. Sorry guys, I'm not gonna let them define who I am or who I am not. Well, like Ronald that, Reagan said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left me. Yeah. But except that, uh, uh, it's an, <laughs> this is an interesting point. And I, you know, perhaps some want to take me onto their side and some people make jokes about this. I mean, one of the jokes is, Shaddy, why don't you just convert to Catholicism already? <laughs> that's, because I, <laughs> but that's because I love Catholic Twitter. And I, I have, I, you know, I, but I also am someone who believes that there are very compelling things about traditions that are not my own. I am a believing Muslim who thinks that Catholicism offers profound insights about the human condition. And I don't want to change them. I right. want them to be Catholic. Right. And I want them to be true to their own ideals. Right. But that to me seems like is increasingly becoming an odd idea in the current discourse that we can see people who come at things from a very different set of starting premises. And we say that is good for pluralism. We want you to be different because that difference contributes something right. important to the way we talk about ideas. And I'm going to fight for that conception. And that's that might make me an outlier. But there are enough of us who believe in this. And I, I've been hardened to see that there there are a lot of people who share share this worldview and we've seen this through the proliferation of newsletters substacks podcasts there are a lot of people who feel um left out you know disenfranchised yeah. or disassociated from the current m way of discourse this i think is our moment yeah and it might not be our moment in mainstream institutions, but we'll just find alternative venues for yeah, saying what yeah. we think is right. Yeah. Oh, and that's the beauty of this moment is the internet and all of this. I mean, it's it's from, again, the, the interesting thing to me is, is that the main thing that's perhaps different between like the blog moment and this moment, the sort of call it the podcast substack moment, is that, is that blogs were like mainstream media was strong enough to just buy up all the blogs right. and create it it's hollow so i think it's, it's right sort now. of a signal moment isn't it that andrew sullivan who basically that's right. created blogging that's right has now returned to it i feel yeah. like it's, it's like a 20-year arc right yeah. he started blogging yeah. around 2000 yeah and then it got to the point where now he doesn't even have a place to blog anymore yeah. so he has to go he has to go and solo. and and you know he he's uh he's a and he can do it he he's can do it a, he's, but a, he's a, a rare right he, but that's that's the logic of these things. But that's the logic of all these things. It's the rare thing. Anyway, Jamie, this has been freaking awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh no, no, I don't want I don't want this to end. <laughs> you can always have me back. Yeah. Oh my god, Jamie's a really good. I think he's a really good guest. I think this was pretty good. If okay. you need like if you need like an Ed McMahon, you know, I'm I'm, I'm already on the <laughs> couch. On the couch. <laughs> all right, man. Great Thank talking. You. Bye. Bye, Jamie.